right. Finally, we managed to set up the environment. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the class. Uh, last session, we couldn't um, manage to project uh, the first lecture on the screen. I'm not sure if um, turning off the light makes it easier to see or makes it easier for you to just go to sleep either way. Um, but we will try. Is, is it visible? Is it fine? All right. So since I wanted to annotate the, the slides on PDF, so I'm trying to test the Adobe here. Otherwise, we just switch back to a slideshow later on in, a, in the next session. So um, I'm trying to wrap up both of the, the things that I've mentioned in the lecture zero. And this is the lecture one. So let's talk about the organization of the class. I've, I've set up the, the wiki side of the, the course. It's going to be found here. So 44E, you have the, you have the access to the, both of the, you have access to both of the materials of previous lecture and today. So take a look at today's lecture, which is lecture one. The PDF is, is more up to date. Your TA is Mahmoud Afifi. He was he is still a, a, out of country, so he's going to be back by the end of the month. But feel free to email me if you need any help or support. But basically, he's going to be the, the main point of contact for your assignments and the grading. Uh, my office hour is all announced on the website, so just make sure to check his website every now and then. Um, if I manage to find a way to email you as well, I'm going to let you know. But either on Mondays or Wednesdays at the time, I'll, I'll let you know um, for that. But feel free to email me as well anytime you had a question. OK, so as you know, that's why you hear uh, the lecture times are Mondays and Wednesdays. And so the first lecture was previous uh, week, the reading week as uh, per the, the registrar's uh, schedule is going to be on the week of October 12th. Right after that, on the, on the first, um, on our first lecture after the, the reading week, we're going to have the, the midterm. And then your last session, yeah, thanks. And your last session would be on uh, either end of November or early December. So we will talk about that when we get closer. But you need to ch uh, check this website normally uh, about the updated rules. I'm just following those. So since there are so, so many grads as well in this course, how many grads are here now? Yeah. So apparently they have opened up some more spots for the grad students. So you should be able to register the, for the course. If you couldn't, let me know, and we try to you know, find a workaround for that. Um, so for the undergrad students, we, we go with three assignments. Uh, I'll weigh the assignments perhaps later. Uh, perhaps the second assignment uh, might weigh more. But roughly speaking, you have 30% assignments, 30% midterm, and 40% final. For the grads, the assignments uh, weights are different. And I'm going to give 25% for a mandatory project or a paper presentation, which I'll explain. In, a, in the next slide. So you have the same midterm and final, but your weight of assignments are different, and you have a project or presentation up to your choice for this. So for the assignments, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll announce the first assignment by next week or so. I, I'll, I'll make sure you have at least two weeks, uh, 10 days to two weeks to, uh, to solve the assignments, especially for the second assignment that is a little bit uh, bigger. And in, inside each of the assignments, I'm gonna, you're going to be asked for a mix of theoretical and programming questions. I don't want to bother you with uh, just copy pasting and stuff because I just want to make sure you learn something, you know. Um, so there's no, you know, there's no uh, need to deal in that. That's why theoretical, if that's just a matter of googling, I mean, it, it doesn't even uh, worth worth the bother of just making the questions. But making them more interesting, you know, playing around with uh, things a little bit. But if you have any questions, just email me or the TA for, uh, you know, more clarification. The midterm, we're going to do it in the, in the class on the first Monday after the, the midterm. So tentatively, I, I put it on my, uh, October 21st. 
And a final exam, depending on the schedule, is going to be around that span of um, you know, final exams. OK? So let's talk about the a presentation or a project for graduate students. So if you go for a presentation, um, you're going to be delivering uh, a 10 minute presentation and a written survey paper of four pages. So by Monday, October 7th, so almost a month, you need to send me an email to specify a subfield of your interest. So just don't email me, yeah, I'm interested in machine learning. Not even email me, I'm interested in deep learning. Go deep, like spend some time, Google some pages, read some uh, articles, I don't know, see some YouTube videos, see what you're interested in. If you are uh, uh, doing your final master's thesis, if you are working or if you're using machine learning, it's even better to just you know incorporate that as well. So say I'm doing my master's in this field, uh, either or I'm trying to adopt the machine learning algorithms of that, and I'm interested in this subfield. And also I found these papers of interest. Send me three or four papers. Uh, we're gonna approve those by October 9th, two days after. So normally when you look for papers, the, the top-notch conferences in machine learning are some of these that I mentioned. So it used to be NIPS by ne last year, so they changed it to NIRIPS. So if you didn't find NIRIPS, don't get, so it was NIPS before. For some obvious reasons, they changed the name after 28 years. Um, so CDPR, ICLR stands for International Conference of Learning Representations, and the last one is International Conference on, of Machine Learning, I believe. So these are the top-notch conferences. Um, I'm not sure why this keeps popping up here. Yeah. So these are normally the top-notch conferences. If you found a paper that were outside these conferences, let me know, I'll approve it. Uh, or we can discuss about it. So perhaps some other conferences, you can find quality papers inside as well. So let me just... Um, toolbar perhaps. Hmm. Toolbar. Yeah, let's leave it like this. Yes, okay, much better now. All right. So. You study those papers, and it's, it's actually a good practice for you if you are doing your uh, thesis because you need to study and survey your you know, related works. So you're going to study those papers and, and write a four pages uh, summarizing those. You sort of survey them. And then you're going to send it to me, that four pages, using either of these templates that you can come up later at, at, at the time of the deadline. And by the end of the course, the last week, you're going to have a presentation of that. So first you submit the survey, and then you present it in 10, 12 slides. So other than that, if you were interested in doing a project instead, send me an email, again, the same deadline, by Monday, October 7th, and then we confirm your project by 9th, and then the, the, the final delivery of the project would be the end of November. Um, so these are the two different... Um, ways you can do your mandatory project or presentation. So the textbook, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, um, we're gonna, the, the bulk of the work is going to be based on the, um, it's famous for the name of the author, second author. So it's called Bishop Book. And for the deep learning section that I was interested in adding to this course, uh, we can use the deep learning book by these three famous authors, uh, Young Goodfellow, Yoshua Bengio, and the third collaborator. And so it's available free 
if you wanted to buy it in Amazon, feel free, but on the website, there is the online contents available. Um, so that's for that. So for the majority of the topics, we use the, the first one, the Bishop book. And for only the deep learning specific uh, topics, we're going to use this book. Questions? Yeah. Uh, at the library, when I was asking about that book, uh, so he was saying he gave me a card to give it to you so that you can send them emails and you uh, put that book for like so that we can go and uh, buy it. Uh, yeah. Oh, because they haven't? They, they, they don't have it. order for something. Oh, okay. So okay. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. So meanwhile, yeah, good to know because I'm I'm, I'm still affiliated with you of the I'm just so new with this uh, progress stuff here. All right, I'll do that. If you, I mean, if, if the price would be the same as long as they are delivering them, you can order it from elsewhere, perhaps Amazon or or just have a look at it online for now, because we have still a month uh, to reach the, the the neural network and CNNs, so you still uh, have time to you know obtain that book. Any more questions? Okay. So, the materials, um, I'd recommend you be presenting a course uh, physically, first of all, uh, because you learn more. And then secondly, we are annotating, I'm trying to find a way to annotate the, uh, these PDFs. So if uh, you know there are other examples needed to add, other annotations needed to add, I'll do that right away. You have this access to the slides normally within 24 hours of the course, I'll upload it to the website, so you have them available as well. Um, so that's for that. There's no huge programming involved in the course, other than your, uh, for two of your assignments, you're um, you know, doing an assignment in MATLAB, which are installed in the lab machines, apparently. I still need to double check if they have installed TensorFlow in that or not, you can even use your laptop. We are not, as I was talking with your friend uh, who asked before the class, we're not training huge models like ResNet 300 that takes like three weeks to train. We are just, you know, trying to learn the dynamics and underlying um, algorithms inside some of the uh, deep learning projects. So that's why even your laptop would be fine, even your CPU of your laptop. But I'll make sure, I'll, I'll ask the uh, your labs to make sure they have installed TensorFlow. If you have GPU support, it's going to be faster. Anyways, uh, if you don't know anything about uh, these two, these two are a good place to start. So this is a tutorial for TensorFlow. It's on Python, and this is MATLAB. Basically, if you know any programming language, these are a scripting language, so they're pretty easy for you. But if you have any specific questions, you can email me as well. Uh, Anyone specific questions right now about these two? All good? Okay. So, let's talk about uh, some introduction about the course. So as you know, uh, I don't have to you know, stress more that the machine learning algorithms and uh, you know, the, the applications of machine learning are emerging in many different domains. So I've just put some uh, some notable actually applications. So first of all, in in uh, you know natural language processing or NLP, we are using mostly recurrent neural network in order to read text uh, and understand the behavior. Perhaps applying recommendation systems on that. Um, dictionaries now use NLP and uh, recurrent neural network as well. Even Google uses uses it for for a while now. So the, the major application and one of the earliest application of machine learning was for classifying images. So this ImageNet competition starts from late 2009 and a task was we had a huge data set of images around a million training images and 50k to 100k images for tests for validations. So every year um, there was a challenge that whoever groups can come up with a better algorithm, better machine learning model that predicts those uh, validation images, so either 50K or 100K, with a higher accuracy, right? So in the past, the trend was, so this is the trend for the, 
for the error rate. So, so you see the trend in 2010 was around 30 percent, 28 percent error rate. So this is the percent of the error rate. So that means that the algorithm that was trained for this task for classifying images of ImageNet, um, the top five accuracy. So say by top five accuracy, I'm talking about say you have five guesses, right? So your algorithm sees an image as an input, and it's going to say, is it a dog, cat, this type of dog, that type of dog, and so on and so forth. So after five guesses, if one of the guesses was correct, so we're going to say the top five accuracy was correct on that specific case. So that means that when you have 30% top five error rate is for 30% of the images of the validations, your top five accuracy, so your top five guesses were not correct, right? So using the same notion, we have top one accuracy, we have top three accuracy, and top five accuracy. So mostly in papers, mostly you're going to see top one and top five. So the first guess or the first top five guesses. So you see the trend that it was going pretty linear, 2010, 11. Up to this point, so the breakthrough happened in 2012, where the, the group of Jeffrey Hinton, who, who is now a, a professor at the University of Toronto now, the computer science department. So they built uh, a new CNN, convolutional neural network, that was much larger than the previous models. And the first author was Alex uh, Krzyzewski. So that's why that model got known as AlexNet. So when 2012 AlexNet introduced, you see the drop in accuracy was huge. So from 25, they went down to 16. So they beat the competitors. The, the second one on the list perhaps was 89% lower than these guys. So these guys completely you know, smashed the, the field and uh, got number one. And out of that, the news came out that we have an algorithm that, you know, can classify images with much, much lower, uh, you know, error rate. So after that, the boom in deep learning started. So after that, it's going to go down and down and down. And the models are getting huger, huger, and huger. So Alex has had five um, convolutions, three fully connected layers. So now the, uh, the ResNet in 2015, the winner of 2015, had more than 100 convolutions. So it's getting to the point that it's very, very huge and you know, computationally intensive. Uh, but it's still, we can see the trend that it's going down. And that's why that was, the, that was one of the earliest uh, applications of deep learning that people got to understand that this is really outperforming the conventional models. So that's only for the application for the uh, classifying images, right? So we talked about NLP here. We talked about images. The other uh, very interesting and intriguing topic is, so these are your DNAs. So I, these are, each of those letters represents DNAs. I'm not an expert on that field, but apparently by tweaking one letter, a human can turn to a donkey or something. But in order to explore that space, uh, you can learn models to, to explore uh, new DNAs, DNAs and explore uh, how we're going to fix some, I don't know, viruses and tackle some uh, health problems. So this sub-problem is, <coughs> sub is called DNA sequencing or gene sequencing. So this is pretty famous. So many people in collaboration with computer scientists now working in health sector to tackle those problems. Also in health sector, they're, they're using image classification to classify diagnosis of cancers, tumors, uh, early stages of cancer, and so on and so forth. So these are very uh, challenging as well. The other very interesting application is called reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is pretty old, perhaps more than 50 years. But deep reinforcement learning was came to, to phase just like the Alex said by the AlphaGo team at uh, United Kingdom when they beat the the groove of the, the game, uh, I believe it was 4-1. Uh, 
so and, and, and the and the game was self taught the the agent that, that was playing the AlphaGo game against that guy was uh, getting trained and he was playing with himself to get trained. Uh, so th there's a nice documentary on Netflix if you wanted to see it. Just Google for that. Um, it's recent as well. And you know the another one that Tesla is pushing is uh, you know driverless cars. Uber is using it as well. We have a location actually in Toronto. Uh, people doing research on that. Uh, I was I was telling you guys the the previous lecture that it's a very uh, exciting time for Canadian research community because many of these well-known researchers are in Canada. Toronto and Montreal specifically. Uh, so you have it. You are starting this, you know, topic in, in, a, in a right time, in a right place. All right. Um, so these are more applications of the, you know, growth of machine learning. So for instance, AI and machine learning is number one in the uh, venture capitals when, when they are spending and they are sponsoring projects and they are uh, sponsoring startups. So by far, they are number one now. The other interesting point is not only on the industrial side, but on the research domain, you see that the NIPS, the previous NIPS, which is now NeurIPS, so you used, this is the number of attendants, right? So it was like, I don't know, 300 people in early 2000s. And so it came up, up to the point that last year, um, when I was attending it in Montreal, that was the plenary room. So. That's actually the presenter in perspective. And the starting, uh, uh, the plenary room, the the first talk was having an attendance of, I mean, he mentioned a, a colleague of us, 6,500. Uh, I believe it was more than 7,000 people there. And uh, you see the, the projectors in section. So there are a huge demand also on the research domain as well. Um, all right. So I hope I got you motivated enough to, you know. Questions? Oh, just process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, it's also very good that because of the some restrictions in U.S. politics, many of these conferences that used to be in, in the United States, they're coming up in Canada. So this year is going to be in Vancouver, I believe. And it's very exciting also for Canadian research community as well. Um, all right, so let's wrap up some of the high-level uh, topics that we're going to cover in this course. Uh, in, in this lecture, we just, you know, sort of talk high-level about the topic. And then starting from the next lecture, we're going to start with the linear model and linear classification. So this is um, an example of a neural network, right? So the word deep that was introduced uh, as of 2012 is just they have increased these layers so this is your input layer where you input your, your data so your data could be anything could be images could be uh, signals could be um, graphs could be anything right and of course on the other side that's your output layer so these layers in between, they're called intermediate le right? layers. So by deep learning, it is a very naive way to you know, uh, define these layers to be, if you, if you count them like as n is equal to 2. For a deep learning model, this, this could be going towards n, where n is a, is a large number. So say 10, 12, 20. So these intermediate levels are, you know, expanded. And that's why the model got deeper and deeper. So that's why this buzzword was created. So everyone's talking about deep learning. Um, deep, so and, and just like that, the convolutional neural network, CNNs, came to the world as deep convolutional neural networks. So that's, that's no big deal um, in general. So you input something, it's going to process it. It's going to assign weight based on the connections. And based on the activations, some of the outputs will be output. And based on the uh, type of the, the layers, whether they are fully connected, they are convolutions, 
uh, they're recursive in, in RNNs, you're going to have an output, which is a number. So using that number or a digit, you can, you can come up with your final solution and test that with the actual solution to see if the actual solution, how close your prediction was with your actual solution, right? And then using that, you can compute your error or your loss function. So we'll talk about it uh, when, when we start you know, talking about neural networks later on. Another application of neural network that is for images, so instead of inputting signals or graphs, if we input images, so a vector of images, which are numbers, and numbers could represent the, the color scheme of your images. Say so you, if you have black and white images, the numbers could be from 0 to 128 or 256, representing the, the spectrum of the color. So you input the image, and then you convolve the images with a filter called convolution, right? Convolution filter. And, it, and it's going to convolve the images, and you're going to output some feature maps. And these layers, again, can go on and on up to the point that you have a fully connected layer at the end. We call it FC. So normally these are convolution layers. And the last one is a fully connected or some some fully connected layers, and it's going to output your prediction, right? So this this is um this is actually a, a very an early convolution CNN, which was uh, proposed by Lacoon, the famous French uh, scientist who is now the head of uh, AI at Facebook. And if you were following the news, uh, Lacoon, including with uh, you show up NGO and University of Toronto's um, Jeff Hinton, they got the, the ACM Turing Award some months ago, which is considered as a, as a noble for computer science. Yeah. What do you mean by if, if, if it's So uh, when, when we talk about CNN, I'll actually explain what exactly convolution is. but. These, there are filters with a specific size. Say you have an input of 3 by 3, right? And you have a 3 by 3 filter. So this is your filter, and this is your input. When I convolve this, well, actually, your, your input could be larger. Say 9 by 9. So you have a 9 by 9 input and a 3 by 3 filter, right? When I convolve this filter with this input, it's as if um, this is my filter. I'm starting to go from left to right or up and down depending on the algorithm. So I'm going to go through the input using my filter <coughs> depending on the order I have. And it's sometimes 3D, right? Different shapes and different methods. So this way I'm generating output by my 3x3 three three filter. And the output is called feature maps. So there are maps that matches these numbers of input and outputs. And you're going to learn exactly what they are because they're pretty intuitive and uh, easy to understand. So when you convolve a filter with an input, you're going to output some feature map. And you're going to, you can just, it's as if you're zooming into different details of the, the photo and understand certain attributes out of your input. The attributes could be high level earlier and lower level later. Um, and then after that, you're going to do um, a matrix multiplication uh, of a kind to output the weights to find the, uh, you know, to find the, the value for the input. So at the end, when you have the output here, it's going to predict a number for you, like in 5. as your first guess, and then it's going to say like, so that by, by 0 0.58, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the label for the class 
31, for instance, I had like, I don't know, 64 classes of output. And a second one could be like, I don't know, 12, the label of the class, 7. So that means that by 70, by 58 percent, um, statistically speaking, by 58 percent, I'm going to say that the, the, my input was belonging to the class 31. And you can just see your label. Perhaps 31 was referring to a cat or something. So in ImageNet, when I was talking earlier, this class labels is 1,000. In this case, that, that Lekun uh, or that Lennet model, so this is called Lennet, this was a, I believe 1990 was proposed. So Lennet was proposed in order to classify the hand digits from 0 to 10. So the output would be either 0 to 9, right? So say it was 5, the input, and it's going to output whether it was a five or not. Okay. Any questions? All right. For TensorFlow, um, you have like many, many tutorials available online. One of the uh, good ones that I always recommend to have a look is the, the Stanford course by um, Andre Carpacci. So he is now the head of uh, AI at Tesla, actually. Interestingly enough, he was an undergrad student at U of D, and he went to Stanford for his PhD. Uh, so he had a very nice course, so you can find it here. For convolutional neural network and DNNs, so if you wanted to have you know, more variety of tutorials, you can have a look at there. But in TensorFlow tutorials, you can, you know, the TensorFlow website or many other websites are providing contents for that. So there's no shortage for sure on that domain. As an example, I put a small um, high-level, you know, view of how we're going <laughs> to initialize a small computational graph in TensorFlow. So basically, after you install the TensorFlow as a library or compile it from the source, you're going to you're going to have the, the library of TensorFlow available, so you can import it in your project, Python projects, and you can name it as you want. So here, we name it as TF. So by using TF dot, you're going to access all the Mishuf inside that library you install. So you can define a placeholder with the size, with the size of seven, 784, and that placeholder contains flow 32 bits, so there are floating points, and you got to define two variables, one W to resemble the weights, one B to resemble the biases, and then one Y as the output. And then inside that TensorFlow again, you're going to have many other functions available at your hand to use. So tfnn.softmax is a softmax that outputs uh, your computational graph. And the output would be matmul, which is the matrix multiplication of that two variables you defined with the bias is as if you are doing uh, AX plus B, right? These are your weights, this is your bias, and this is the output of that. And then in general, in hindsight, in, uh, as a general uh, method, you need to have an optimizer to converge to when you train that. And that's how you're gonna train a model. So that's just a quick example. I mean, it's pretty easy and intuitive if you, if you just Play, play around a little bit, you're going to, you know, get the idea. Okay? Okay. So these are some of the buzzwords and jargons of, uh, you know, bag of machine learning that you're going to, hopefully, you're going to learn a, a, um, a lot about many of those. So I'm just putting it here. So, let's talk about some uh, theories and high-level materials. So, first of all, let's go back to the machine learning now. Why do we need machine learning at all, right? Now, we have many, you know, uh, 
useful applications of machine learning in self-driving cars, speech recognition, and other complex problems that simply we couldn't be able to do some years ago without machine learning. And they are working on high dimensional data. So by high dimensional data, I'm not talking about a 3D data. Let's talk about an N dimensional data. You have like a thousand or millions, right? When you want to do a fraud detection or when you want to do a, an antivirus when it, and it tries to, you know, uh, classify a, a malware. So it might be the case that that dimension is very, very large. And that's why by hand, by no means, you can, you know, tackle that, first of all. Secondly, you cannot find any pattern out of that. And that's why you cannot induct anything. You cannot predict anything out of it. So definitely, there are many complex tasks that we need some guidance in order to help us derive some predictions or some generalization on how to tackle those, right? So that was that was one of the major reasons that we need <coughs> machine learning. In general, we are trying to learn something from the data we have, right? We have some data. We don't know what they are sometimes in unsupervised learning. Um, and we are trying to understand patterns. We are trying to, to classify them. We are trying to cluster them, so different tasks of machine learning. But all should come from having a data. If you don't have data, there is no problem to start with, right? If somebody comes and then say, tackle this task, and I don't have any data, you know, your, your answer would be simply, there's no way I can do that, because there's no data on this. So the, the more data you have, the more chance to find some patterns from that data and learn something from that data, right? Okay. So I'm just going to pass this. This is very general. As an example, let's, let's have a look at a representation of data. So when we talk about rows here, normally we talk about the instances, the samples, the examples, right? on the rows. On the columns, we normally talk about features, right? So in this case, my patients are from P1 up to PM, so I have M rows. And here, I have, say, N features, right? So my features are what? Age, temperature, blood pressure, so I have some uh, database of patients, uh, and the features are their age, their, their, their body temperature, their blood pressure, and the last column of the features normally is called the label, right? In a supervised learning method that I'll talk about um, you know, later, so one of the classes of machine learning, in supervised learning, we have the labels, so this is available. So when we train we have the data and we have the labels, right? This is in supervised learning. And when a new patient comes after we train this model, say patient P M plus one comes here, right? And I'd like to test it. I get the, the patient's data, the features, I don't know, 75, 39, and so on and so forth. And the task would be to use this model to predict a label for me, for this patient, right? And a label in this case is a binary class only, either yes or no, right? So given a new patient, not included in a training set, I feed the model my feature vector, and the model predicts a label, in this case a binary uh, class. Either uh, this patient having these features, uh, you know, have, has a disease or not, right? 
that's a classic way to do supervised learning. In unsupervised learning, we don't have that label class, and we are trying to establish patterns only with our, you know, training data. I'll talk about that later as well. So, in general, yeah, the task would be to, to predict a new label for a new patient that includes the list. Okay? Is it straightforward? Oh, yeah. Now, before even going to uh, you know establish the, the the feature representation, let's see. Let's drive some rules based on the the data we have, right? So, say I have this data. So the red dots and the black dots. I'm trying to establish a rule, a hypothesis, or a classifier, so that I can distinguish between my lines, right? In this case, I have two classes, red and black. I need to be able to classify them, right? Normally, we call this H as a hypothesis. So. When I define that hypothesis, when I define my classifier, that classifier should also work on new unseen examples, right? That was the whole purpose. If I had all my data seen, I didn't want any classifier at all because I could classify them because I was seeing them, right? So what happens if I pick this, this line and then I have a new red here? So if I take this line as my classifier, and my unseen data comes on the other side as red, now my predictor is predicting false, right? It's an error. So how can I choose this and generalize on the data? How can I train this? How can I tweak it a little bit? Can I have higher dimensions? Can I have polynomial lines, right? Can I have a 2D or 3, uh, 3D sort of lines? So these are all the different things that uh, we gotta learn in this course. And is there any price to pay when I make this more complex? When I make my hypothesis line or my predictor more complex? So, say I have this data, again two classes, red and black, I have found this line as my predictor, that's my edge. So is it going to work better or is this going to work better? Ideas? Um, that looks too specific, like you wouldn't learn well. Good. Why is it too specific? Just the way it's shaped. It just seems like it's boxing the red line. Yeah. Exactly. So when you go too fine grain, when you go too specific based on a, a specific type of data, there is an, there's a well known problem in machine learning that is called overfitting. So my predictor is overfitting to the current data, right? So what happens if I have a red right here now? So it's going to fail. On the other side, if I have a complex data, I mean, now this is a 2D, this is pretty easy to, to, to see, but if you have an n-dimensional data and you have a simple line on the other side, you have underfitting. So these are the two extremes of two pitfalls of learning models in machine learning, right? And how, how are we going to quantify that? How are we going to use uh, math in order to understand where we need to stop training, where we need to do more training uh, to come up with the, you know, uh, a well-trained hypothesis. Okay. So, given this data, what predictor 
we should now consider. <coughs> so what if I told you a grid label now is generated by a random coin flip? So if, if I'm randomly generating some data, right, what's going to happen? This is one way, but you, you have to keep training forever, right? You can't stop this. Way. But that's a possibility. So the more randomized your points are, right? In general, in theory, you're more closer to find um, a more uh, I mean, let's, let's put it this way. The more random your data set is, the more you're prone to have error, right? Because you can't find any pattern. And machine learning is all about finding pattern. I'm not saying you bias your data set, but on the other extreme, if you have a complete random data set, basically there's nothing to learn inside, right? It's completely random. Uh, so that's another pitfall for that. All right. As I just mentioned, machine learning can only work if there is something we can learn. Something. We don't know what, but we, we can learn something. In many of the uh, machine learning classifiers or predictors, we don't know actually how we are learning it. We just know that we are learning it, right? We don't know how. We're just training on data and come up with a, with a predictor that works on this data. And that's the beauty of machine learning. You don't know how the, you don't have to know how to come up with the, the mathematical solution of that to completely find that f function. But your f prime function, which you learn, sort of mimics that f function with a pretty close you know, uh, margin. And that's the beauty of machine learning. All right. So most of the times, we call learning in machine learning as an inductive process. So we have inductive process or we have deductive process, right? Can anyone uh, on top of his mind mention what's the difference in general between an induction or deduction? This deduction is more like systematic that you have a set of rules that if we apply it, so you have it open. But in induction, it's more like um, step by step that is built upon each other. Like yeah, close enough. Right. So uh, deduction, you can normally, it's completely mathematical, right? You have a generalized rule, and from top down, you're gonna you're gonna go okay. This general rule applies for this data, and I have this data, so this should apply on that. For induction, you are learning from bottom up. You are seeing instances and try to establish pattern and induct something, right? So machine learning works as an inductive tool that needs prior knowledge. So let's see some examples. So we are trying to, to uh, you know, train a model, a machine learning model that predicts whether a, um, this type of fruit is tasty, is tasty or not, right? So by just looking at the, the papaya, we, uh, we are trying to understand if it's tasty or not. So how are we going to do that? First of all, we need to find a way to input this to, to a computer to understand this. Because we can just input the fruit, right? We need to find a feature to quantify that, that fruit, right? We have to uh, you know, find a feature that represents my problem. And definitely, as a prior knowledge, when I'm trying to establish a machine learning project, I need to know what are the things that are important in this specific domain, right? So what sort of features I should consider at all when I, when I want to build a model? So I can say, hmm, colors might play a role here. I'm not sure, but we can try. And softness of the papaya, perhaps, another prior knowledge. So without these two, you can't even you know, be able to quantify this and you know, learn something out of that, right? So say suppose, uh, 
we have color and softness that we try to you know gain some information about whether a papaya is tasty or not, right? So I've established my two representations. So now I have a two D feature space. So color and softness, and then I have my data, which are the samples that I saw on this. So generally speaking, there should be a range here that the the color and softness of papaya in, in, in most of my data should conform to this. And I found that inside this range, I normally found that when I was testing those papayas, those were tasty, right? So I'm trying to establish that perhaps if I have some points here and there, the ones that I tested were normally within a range, a, a rectangular range. So perhaps a rectangular you know, feature space may be a good predictor here, right? Now I'm going to collect my, my data. So again, I have two set of classes because um, my output was tasty or not, right? So I have two classes. Now. The goal of my project is to fit a rectangular that satisfy the problem that I was just describing, right? Now this is the goal to find that is specific rectangle. Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? Is it the other way around, right? Where? my predictor in this feature space fits the best given my training data. Now, when I stop learning, now when I fix this predictor, now this predictor should be able to classify the future on scene points because that was the whole project, right? Because we were these examples were all this scene. So we already knew if they are tasty or not. This was, for instance, not. This was yes. So given all this data, I've trained this. And using this now, if a new model, if, if a new data comes, say uh, a tasty one, if it places here because of my features that I defined, I was right. If this one was places here outside that, I was wrong, right? right? So in summary, that's the five high-level steps to any machine learning model in general. You choose the feature representation, and that's your d-dimensional d space of R, depending on the features here. You have your label classes. In, a, in our class, it was minus 1 and plus 1, a binary class. Tasty or not, it could be multi-class, could be binary. And then, Choose a class of predictors, right? Small h from all set of hypotheses, the capital H, that can map my input to output, which was a label. So I start collecting data. So x1, y1 was for the first papaya, papaya 1, and that was the nth one, right? And then I fit a model using any other any optimizations that I was uh, you know, interested in to find the, the best one that yields the best prediction and, and lowest error rate. So finally, using that edge, I'm trying to mimic my F, which was unknown. So the predictors, uh, small H is the rectangle? In this case, I, I could have picked uh, a circular edge. That was still among my you know, tools. Just like in neural network, uh, when, when you want to learn when you want to learn something, you use backprop, backpropagation. So that, that's the edge for neural network. In SVMs, the quadratic programming was, was the edge. Uh, in linear classification, the, the perceptron was the edge.
So you could use anything. But generally speaking, when you when you have many edges, you can have a minimization out of those and find the best one. But for certain models, it has been established that certain edges were, you know, were going to yield the best results. The edge is actually like, um, can you tell what edge is? It's, it's a it's, function that predicts, right? It's, 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 it's a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis that tries to mimic your real function that outputs your input your outputs. So you, you, you input your aces, your papayas, and then that unknown function would tell you if, if it's tasty or not. But you didn't have access to that. You, you learn that by edge, and edge mimics them. So how closely it is, you can find it by you know testing it. Right? That's the whole premise of machine learning. You find edges to mimic your unknown f. Because if f wasn't known, you didn't have any machine learning. I mean, you didn't have to learn. So we choose the best edge of the possible ones? You can, you can choose any edges, but if you, use, if you don't use the best edge, you have higher error. Right. So just a quick clarification for each. So each is a function where x is still the features and y is still the labels. Yeah, y is the, the actual output. Okay, yeah. but then that's just a hypothesis, but f is like the actual. A f function. is the actual. So, yeah, the actual. Uh, I would say function, actual unknown function. Actual yeah, let's call it unknown. I mean, you know that there must be an f, but nobody can quantify it. Is it at 17th order of polynomial? Who knows? Nobody knows. That's that. That's the beauty of machine learning. You don't know. What, you don't know how to solve it, but you can train it and you can learn how to output the correct, the closely correct. You know, close enough. Yeah, result. And that's the beauty of machine learning. Any questions? I'm, I'm, I want to I want to make sure all of you guys get this idea because this is the uh, the foundation of you know machine learning. So there we cannot find like what kind of approach you're using to supervise and not supervise. Is it like um, because it, it is binary in some cases? Yeah, this is binary. In the, so this example was a supervised learning because you had you had the label classes. So when you were training, you could see the output, right? All good? Do we sometimes also use f prime um, instead of? Yeah, yeah. 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 There are, I mean, they have like, we have many different manuals with different set of rules. Yeah. In my previous um, course, we were using f prime. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about another example. So first, let's see if we have we have an exp experiment on learning with cats. I'm um, sorry, with rats. So we have the rats are having two choices. So either they can um, in, in, in terms of you know choosing their, their, their water, so if they choose the water, one of the water can make them sick, the other one doesn't, right? So they have they're given two choices. So the first experiment is we make sure that those two are tasting differently, right? One is neutral, one sugary. So now, by this, rats can very fast learn how to distinguish between the, the, that type of water and the type of effect that they would have after drinking that water. But for the second experiment, we can do something more interesting. So we add more detail, more elaboration on that water, right? We, we play some audio. We, Stimuli. So uh, we add some more intrigue, uh, you know, detail on, on that specific uh, classes that, that they are going to choose. So what's going to happen now? So in this case, those rats that are trained 
by just the the taste of the water, they did not learn anything from the audio, right? Because they weren't trained for that. Say, say we we train some sort of rat that understands the audiovisual stimuli, right? Say we call that a super rat that understands that that specific uh, input or bias. So what's going to happen now? So now, the super rats would be able to adapt their eating behavior also to the sound and the light of the water. So now, would you say the super rats are going to stay healthy or the, the old good old rats? Which one? Which of them? Okay. And thus? Right. So so say if I if I keep if I keep adding more uh, exotic features. Uh, would they be able to train and adapt themselves? They're learning too much. It's like if they have to taste the water and make sure the lights are right and the sound, they'll never drink water if not all those conditions are met. Right. You, you make them more conditional in this case? Too, more, too, too much information? So it also depends on the uh, duration of which are good, how far they related to make them so good not like mm -hmm. Right. Any more? Okay. So actually, the general consensus was was okay. Yeah, it was true actually. So the more you add these exotic features, and the, the more you train super rats, so they're gonna they're gonna have to pay more attention into these fine grain details, right? And at the end of the day, when you want to generalize this, they're not able to generalize from their previous experiments and to, to, to come up with a, a useful prediction. So uh, as a rule of thumb, not all the very sophisticated feature representation and fine-grained details matter when you want to generalize a machine learning project, right? So that's one of the pitfalls of machine learning. It's, it, 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 it all comes down to you know having a trade-off. All right. So we talked about this as well. You mentioned that, yeah, the, the H1, say you call this H1, they call this H2. So H1 is much more simpler. Perhaps you have more error rate. You already have one error here. So say you have 10 points. So you have like 10% error rate already for H1. But your H2 has zero. But then your, your H1 is more generalized, right? Your H2 is overfitting too much. If, if your new unseen data comes and then they're outside this boundary, you have wasted so much time to overfit to your, your data. OK. So we talked about this as well. We talked about the difference between deduction and induction. So deduction comes top down, so say, your first premise was every person in this room is a student, and every student is older than 10 years. Thus, every person in this room is older than 10 years, right? It's a deduction, classic math. But in induction, we throw a lot, a lot of things very often. In all of our experiments, the things fell down and not up. Right? So we conclude that likely things always fall down. So that, that's the, the part of uncertainty, right? In induction. In machine learning, we, we, we can't afford to be we cannot afford to be completely sure because we are inducting something. So we say likely things always fall down. 
Okay. Is it clear? And as the humans, we induct this sort of reasoning all the time. Um, okay. And you know, the holy grail of machine learning is it aims at automating the process of inductive reasoning to infer something. Okay. Uh, so this is an extra one. Yeah, we're almost done, actually. So, yeah, that's actually the last slide, I believe so. So, the tentative plan for this course is we're gonna we're gonna start from next session by linear models um, in supervised learning. So, and then we go to Bayesian reasoning and Bayesian network. We tackle both ta tasks of regression and classification, and we, we come up with the, the details of each of those, uh, their application, and the differences. And then we go uh, learn about kernel methods. And one of the, the, the famous kernel methods is called super vector machines, or SVMs. Um, then you're going to learn some, uh, some details about how to select your models, which models work the best, how to cross-validate your models, how to uh, understand their, their biases and variances. So there's a famous theory on bias and variance on how to pick your models. And then perhaps by the, just before the midterm, uh, one week or two weeks before that, they're going to start neural networks and then moving on to deep neural networks and convolution on neural networks. So, um, by the middle of this, um, you're going to have your first assignment, perhaps. And then your second assignment. Or perhaps I'm going to wait after we finish this. That's going to be your first assignment. Your second assignment with TensorFlow would be this about deep learning. And a third assignment, the last one, would be here. Um, Perhaps I'll, I'll wait more about the TensorFlow assignment, or if I mean we, we can go on ten, it'll be either we can you know weight them equal ten percent or just I don't know eight eight and then fourteen fifteen percent for that. So that's your assignment. Uh, and after midterm, we're gonna carry on with convolutional neural networks and then unsupervised learning, uh, clustering and dimension reduction. Um, I'll try my best to you know introduce more recent stuff so that you know it's going to be more useful for you guys because machine learning was there since the 50s um, and there are tons of math and algorithms re related to that but uh, I'm hoping you know we can we can learn those you know preliminary stuff quickly and you just go on with the, the more recent and advanced topics um, any questions for this lecture okay I believe that's going to be the last slide. All right, so see you guys on Wednesday.